It is because of the Lord's loving kindness that we are not consumed. (laughs) Because his tender compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great and beyond measure is your faithfulness. It's an awesome thing to think about that every day we get up, dad's got a new toy. I mean, as a child, we, we live and we go, I love birthdays and Christmas because I get a new toy and, and dad, mom, they're good. But see, dad, every day has something new, a blessing for us. And a toy, of course, is a very incomplete view, but just to grasp from the childlike perspective, wow, God, you have something for me. But here's the thing, if, if he has something new for us, a blessing, his compassionate heart for his sheep every day, it's probably true that a lot of times we don't see it. There's something new, there's some blessing, there's some wonder God has for us, but it just, we don't see it. It just goes right by. It's like someone talking to you and they go, are you listening to me? Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I didn't hear you. The wives are going, preach it, Brother Dave, <laughs> right? But it's true. So how much do we do that with God? God's got this new thing for us, right? He's got this blessing for us. And, and, and the Holy Spirit says, did you hear that? And he goes, excuse me, what? No, I didn't, I didn't hear that. See, I want to address that tonight. I believe God wants to address that tonight because he doesn't want us missing out on those new mercies. He doesn't want us missing out on that new thing that he's doing. See, I think sometimes we... We get so caught up in a rut, we just miss out. You ever notice that when you go on vacation, one of the things you usually do is look at the prices of houses? Come on. Right? Because, well, you never know. I mean, honey, this mountain view with the, with the rapids down there, it's pretty nice. And this is a fraction of our house with the cost is back there in whatever country that is they call that, Florida. Yeah. Right? It's amazing. It, when we get somewhere, it's like new places inspire new thoughts and new dreams. They just do. You know, we, we had our pastors meeting this Tuesday, Jacob and, and Ty and I, at Blaze Pizza because they had half off sale. Mm. And so it was cool having our pastors meeting, and boy, it was packed. You know, it was beyond capacity, as you can imagine, half off Blaze Pizza. Hello. But we're sitting there, and it's great, and we walk out, and it's a beautiful day, and we're going to go back to the church here to, to I don't like to call this the church, we're the church, the building reveal, much better. We're about to go back to the building reveal to have continue our meeting, but we're looking around for like a bench or something, it's such a beautiful day, is to have our, our meeting somewhere else, because it's just something special about new places, inspiring new thoughts and new dreams. Why do you think it's when we go to the mission field many times, we're, we're more anxious to, and more enlightened to actually maybe lay hands on somebody or see a miracle when we go to the mission field we're, versus when we're at home? It's true. It's because at home we're in our rut. It's the same people, the same building, the same temperature of the air, the same, you know, climate. It, it, it's the same. And so we begin to be that hamster on the wheel just doing the same thing. Nothing seems to be new at all. That's usually why we move, because we're sick and tired of the same old, we're, we're caught in a rut, we need something new. It's not new geographical experiences you need, it's new spiritual experiences that you need. That's what really stimulates more than a new house or a new mountain to climb or a new bicycle or a new car or a new boat or new this. And we go after all this new stuff that's going to burn one day versus God, you've got new stuff for me every day. And I'm more busy on the new stuff of the world than the new stuff from heaven. It sounds kind of backwards, doesn't it? You want to know why? It doesn't matter whether you want to know why or not. You're going to hear it. (laughs) Turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. I can give you a little insight to our leadership meeting on Tuesday morning because we covered some of these things. I thought it would be beneficial for you guys to hear some of it. Okay. Matthew. Verse 14. The scripture says... The disciples of John 
came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples, Jesus, do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth in an old garment, for the patch pulls away from that garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins will break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. The disciples of John the Baptist are coming to Jesus and they're saying, we don't understand why you're not doing things religiously like we're doing. It doesn't make sense. And Jesus pretty much, he says, there's no reason to fast to seek my face because they're, they're seeing my face. They're right here. There's no reason for them to go about that process of pressing in when I'm here. We're, it's like the bridegroom and the bride, we're together right now. But these disciples of John's, as we're the Pharisees, they're more like, they're messing out. Like, it makes no sense. Why would you be in mourning at a wedding? Can you imagine, after the resurrection, the disciples that came to ask Jesus that question go, here, what a bonehead we were. We're up talking to Jesus about prayer and fasting, and we were right there in the presence of God in the form of a man. Boy, we blew it, Right? Have you ever felt that way? Maybe some of you might have left here Sunday morning after other people were just being blown away by God, and you walked away going, ah, I just didn't get it. I, I, I hold the whole Holy Spirit thing, and I'm pressing in, and I heard about the grieving and the quenching, and maybe that's my problem. Maybe I'm grieving, and maybe I'm quenching. Maybe I'm doing both. But I was right in the presence, I guess, of the bridegroom, and I wasn't getting it. Why? Could it be you were trying to put new wine in an old wineskin? Could it be you weren't looking for something new? You see, what they were doing was not bad, praying and fasting. Now, of course, from a theological point of view, it's very clear we're talking about the old approach to God being under the law versus the new work under grace. Okay? We can't not observe that looking at that text no doubt but I think there's something else to be applied here see God gives us certain ways of doing things certain experiences that we have and they were him when it happened but he didn't want us to cling to the experience he wants us to cling to him and there's a big difference Jesus, I tell you what, he came on the scene and he just did things differently. Talk about getting kicked out of their comfort zone, and they didn't like it. A lot of churches don't like that. That's why a lot of churches are dead. They're stuck in their old wineskin. This is the way God did it back in the past when the wheel was invented, and this is the way he's going to do it today. Now, I know some of you might be getting concerned like now, what is he trying to add on to the Bible? Calm down. No, no, I'm not trying to add on to the Bible. I want you to understand something that might be eluding you, and maybe that's the reason why you're asking for God's power and you're not experiencing it. See, interesting, right after Jesus says this whole thing about not putting new wine in an old wineskin, the next verse, verse 18, he says, while he spoke these things to them, in other words, there's a connection to these things he just said and what's just about to happen, all right? While he spoke these things, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died. But because, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus rose and followed him, and so did the disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came in behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around And when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, make room. 
Boy, that's a sermon right there. Whew. Make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed Jesus. They're about to eat some humble pie. Here we go. But when the crowd was put outside, we don't need spirit grievers in here. Get outside. He went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose, and the report of this went out into all the land. This is amazing. This ruler, he was going outside of the box. He was asking Jesus for something that made no sense whatsoever. Right? This was not the religious norms. This wasn't synagogue protocol. This wasn't in the Christian handbook manual. This wasn't in the the statement of faith for the church. It wasn't written down. Jesus wants us to come to him for things that make no sense whatsoever. Right? Because that's what children do. They ask for things that make no sense. And dad says, watch what I'm going to do. The woman, it makes no sense. She's Levitically unclean. She's supposed to walk around and say unclean. She's supposed to be in a tent sitting down somewhere. She's not supposed to be out in a crowd of people, much less going to touch a holy rabbi. Right? That makes no sense whatsoever. But there's some new wine going on in these people's heads. It might not be what the rabbis teach, but... I'm being drawn to a relationship and experience with God, his very heart. And I'm being drawn to this. And even though the Pharisees would tell me I'm not allowed to do this, I'm hearing God call me. I know it makes no sense he could raise the dead, but something's telling me that God wants to do something new. Makes no sense I can reach out and touch, but I don't know. I just hear the heart of my creator calling me to reach out and draw near, and he's going to call me daughter you see. But what happens is the other people like John's disciples and some of the other people that were ridiculing Jesus, they were back there stuck in the rut. This is the way it's always been done. This is the way we were taught. So it must be so. They're the kind of people that just, they're like robots going through the motion spiritually. Some of us are like that. We're just we're going through, okay, we get up, we, we read our page out of Oswald Chambers, and we, we have our devotion time, and we say a prayer, and we're on our day. We have our little ruts that we go through, and we get stuck, right? And, and there's no real deep expectation or wonder in our expectations of God to move and do something because we've got God pigeon-toed. We've got him figured out, right? We have our Bible verses. We know what the Scripture teaches. We know what the Word tells us. Do we really I don't know about you, I'm on a journey learning that. I I don't have it all down. And God's always wanting to do something amazing and blow my mind, just like we want to do with our kids when we bless them at Christmas time. We love the call, in our house we call it the wow gift, right? Like, that came out of left field, my gosh, right? How much more does Papa God love to give us the wow gift and just bless us? But we so like to limit him, don't we? And we we take certain things that he's given us and, and, and we... We actually use those things to limit God moving in our lives. You say you can't do that. Why do you think Jesus couldn't do any miracles in his hometown because of their lack of faith? Of course we can limit the move of God by our lack of faith and expectations. You know, I don't think we limit the sovereign plan of God. He's got a plan, you know what I mean? But when it comes to the blessings of God and the life of the child of God, sure you can. How do we do that? Well, as it's been said, nothing's new under the sun. See, it's interesting. In, in different Gospels, in Matthew, you see this miracle follow after Jesus talks about the new wine and the, and the old wineskins don't do that. And so in Luke, it's the same thing. And in Matthew, it's the same story, but they don't follow through, the writers, with the story of the healing. They follow through with something else that connects to Jesus' point, which gives us a little more insight of what this whole new wine, the old wineskin, and how we have to be careful about it. See, in in the Gospel of Mark, right after he says the same response to John's disciples concerning the new wine, the old wineskins, he says something different instead of experiences of healing. In Mark chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now it happened that he went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. 
And the Pharisee said to him, look, why do, they, what, why do they do what they do? Not lawful is on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So you hear that you have these guys that are holding on to this old wineskin, which is the Sabbath. It was a day. It was a day that was a, a great picture of Jesus. He is our Sabbath rest. Amen? Amen? So here's this prophetic picture of the person of Christ and Messiah, the Sabbath. Now the old wineskin, they're still worshiping the old wineskin. Jesus is like, I fulfill the Sabbath. I am the Sabbath. And, and he says this statement that's amazing to me. He says, the Sabbath was made for man. In other words, man's the focal point. The Sabbath was a gift to man to be a message to man of Christ. It wasn't that the Sabbath is the point and man is here to serve the Sabbath. Because if you do that, then you're stuck on the hamster wheel. You're missing the point. For example, God has given us the reading of Scripture. He has given us the call to prayer. He's given us lots of things we do as we look at Acts 2, 42-47 and the different activities and protocols of the church. But what happens, many times we live to serve those things. And that's no different than what they were doing with the Sabbath. That's trying to put new wine in old wineskin. See, if you think experiencing the new thing with Father God is by, I gotta read more, I gotta pray more, I gotta share more, I gotta do this stuff more, you're no different than the Pharisees of John the Baptist. And that's why you're missing out on the new thing. See, we should be just reading the word and spending time in prayer and fasting just out of a joyful relationship with Father, not so we can get something from God. We've already got that free from God when Jesus said it's finished. Amen? Right? You see how we're backwards? And we're going, why are other people experiencing all these new mercies and compassions and blessings from Father God every day? And I seem to be missing the boat, man. It's because you're worshiping the Sabbath instead of who it represents. You're worshiping Christendom. I know people that worship the Bible. Seriously. Now, for those of you that don't know me, let me clarify. I love the Word of God. But this, in truth, is not the Word of God. This is the written Word of God. And Jesus, John said, there's many things Jesus said and did that, we, that are not in this book. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been enough books in the world to write everything Jesus did, right? Right? So, in other words, if I love the Word of God, it's not the book. It's the Word of God who is a person. So, we've been given, if you would, the Sabbath, a tool something that God's given us that's inerrant, it's flawless, it's the word of God, it's his heart and his mind, no, black and white, man, love it. But I don't worship this book. I don't worship the Sabbath. I don't worship praying. I don't, I don't put my hope in those things as that's a means to experience the new thing from God today. Because that's called legalism. You follow what I'm saying here? This is a, this is a problem in the church today. So we wonder why other people are just experiencing this waterfall from heaven and this joy and this, this passionate relationship with God. And they go, man, they must have memorized the Bible. You know? They must like pray all the time in order to get that experience. Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. See how we mix the old covenant and new covenant together? We can't do that and expect to experience the outpouring of God. As we talked about Sunday, and if you weren't here, I'd encourage you to go online and listen to the sermon, but the whole point is that God wants this intimate, passionate relationship with us that's just like all the time, constantly. He, he, he wants us to where we're on the verge of tears, all the time. On the verge of just praying in the Spirit all the time. All the time going, Lord, show me someone who's going to hell that needs to hear the gospel. Just show me, Lord. All the time. 
right? That perpetual power, man, it's just always. And, and each day he has some new insight and blessing and, and word just to affirm his love for us and his plan for us and his delight in us and his rejoicing over us, man. It's just every day he has this, but some of us are really missing out on this incredible, wonderful journey with Jesus because we're too busy trying to put the new wine, the gospel of Jesus Christ, into the old wineskin, right? of I have to do, do, do in order to get, get, get from dad. We're still doing it. Not only that, but we worship experiences. I love when God does something new. My challenge is when he does something new to not log that in as the reference to define whether God is doing something new again. That's confusing? Well, let me clarify. It was just last week, or last week, the last 777, we were having a prayer meeting, and it was like a new experience for me. That was new. One particular night, the Holy Spirit moved in this place where it was like I walked away and go, God, your presence was liquid for me. Now, that might sound weird to you, and that's fine. That's weird. It wasn't weird for me. That's the best way I could put it in my head with the experience. Now, I'm, we're not going to start a church called the Liquid Holy Spirit Church. Okay? Because that would be weird. Right? I, I rejoice in the experience, but I'm not going to now, God, give me a Liquid Holy Spirit experience today. You know, I, I remember the time I was in prison preaching the gospel back in the like, late 80s, like 88, 89, and we're having this incredible ceremony for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I used to go every Sunday and Monday night, preach the gospel, and it was just powerful. Each time it was powerful, but this particular night, we were in Acts chapter 2, and I'm preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and afterwards, man, we have some worship music going on, and we're just, we're praying and pressing God, laying hands on guys, and it was just an incredible experience. About a half an hour in, after I lay hands on this one guy, I open up my eyes, and I literally physically see clouds in the room. It was, uh, now, this never happened again. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, I mean, it was awesome, but we're not going to be the church of the clouds. Okay? Don't you love how you didn't see disciples walking around with people who have problems with sight? Go, hey, James, did you get the bucket of mud? We need the mud to slam in people's eyes because that's what Jesus did. Right? See, what happens is we have a certain experience with God, and, and, and it's wonderful. It was of God, kind of like the old wineskin or the old covenant, the old commands. They were all wonderful and glorious and of God, and they were a gift from God, but they were to be a procession, and a, a, a glory to glory, a domino effect, moving us closer and closer to him and to become like him, right? But we're not supposed to worship that place or that experience or that tool or that vessel that God used, we're supposed to grow up because if we take the thing that God used, see what happened is the old covenant became an idol for the Pharisees. They worshiped the old covenant over God. They worshiped the Sabbath over whom the Sabbath represented. That's insane, right? But we do the same thing when we worship the teaching of the Bible over knowing God. It's crazy. And we're wondering why we're not experiencing an outpouring from God. It's because we've taken the beautiful, wonderful things he's given us and we're worshiping, them, worshiping those as an idol and saying, well, God, I've got this figured out and if you do it like I'm expecting you to do it now, I've seen you do it in the past, then it's you. But if it ain't like that, it's not you. But God, do a new thing. It doesn't work like that. Because as soon as you got it figured out, it might have been God, but now he'll change it. Aren't you so glad we don't have the Ark of the Covenant today? The table of showbread, or the altar of incense, or the veil. If we did have the veil still, I'm convinced it would be sewn up. You know, it was thousands of years ago after the people of God were blessed with a new experience, salvation if you would, it was the days that the people of God, after 70 years in Babylon, were freed. They were let go. 
God says, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going I'm to bring you deliverance. And I'm going I'm to call you out of Babylon. And I'm going to take you back home to a land that I promised you. And you're going to build my house. And, and it's going to be glorious. As we talked about Sunday, out of 2 million people, only 49,000 went. Only 49,000 were open to a new thing. Not many. I think it's the same with the church today. Not many are open to a new thing. But see, out of that 49,000 that were open to a new thing, not all 49,000 were really open to a new thing. So you've got the group of, here's the church, and then you've got this sliver who says, I'm open to a new thing and God doing something. But out of that sliver, there's a small remnant that are really open to it. Out of that sliver, out of that 49K, You've got the ones that are saying we're open, but they're quenching the Holy Spirit, and that's why nothing's happening, All right? See, it was, they were delivered from Babylon to go do this work of the Lord, and Ezra says something amazing in chapter 3. It says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and Levites and the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever towards Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of the father's houses, old men, who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice with the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the voice of the shout of joy from the noise of weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the sound was heard far off. Here you've got this group of the 49,000. You've got a group of people that are the young bucks and they're going, Wow, God, you're doing something incredible. This is amazing. And, and we're in your presence. We're worshiping. But there was another group of people that their minds are going, yeah, it's great, but I can't help but weep when I compare this, what you're doing, God, to what you did with Solomon's temple. Because back in the day, back in the day, that was amazing, God, what you did. And I'm still living back there in the old wineskin. I'm still going, that was awesome, God. What were they doing? They were worshiping a building that ended up being destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, right? They're worshiping a building, man, instead of who the building represented. That's what's going on in the church today. We're still trying to put new wine in an old wineskin. Hey, God moved David and Solomon to build that temple. Awesome. But it only represented something. He didn't want us to get attached. I mean, how would you feel giving your kids a gift and give little Johnny a G.I. Joe, and he just, just, just loves the G.I. Joe, and he talks, thank you so much for coming into my life, G.I. Joe, and, and I just want to do everything with you. You like, double his meds, Mom. You know, let's get this kid to a doctor. Let's get him assessed. It's like, what is he doing? But that's what we're doing. We're worshiping the temple, the gift, the Bible, the church. Well, tell me about your walk with Jesus. Well, I go to reveal, I didn't tell your church. Tell me about Jesus. Tell me about your experience with him. What are you learning? Well, my pastor, don't tell me about your pastor. Tell me about what the Holy Spirit is teaching you and showing you, right? We're still looking at the old wineskin, guys. We're quenching the Spirit. Because you got to do it this way. I need some liquid Holy Spirit today. I need some clouds in the room, man. Unless I can speak in tongues, something's not right. Man, if the service, if everyone's not prophesying, the anointing is not among us. Right? I mean, I love where God does things, healings, prophecy, tongues. It's all good, but that's just clouds and liquid Holy Spirit. That's great, but that's not what I worship. And if God does something, then he does something. The biggest thing I want to see is people falling in love with God and their lives being transformed. That's a sign of the anointing among us, right? Those are the things we seek after because that's what the world's looking for more than all the stuff that we like to look at and go, that's how we decide whether God's among us.
200 years, 200 years before Israel was freed from Babylon, Isaiah had something to say concerning God's ways and God's people. Isaiah 43, he said, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, look down deep, right? Look below the surface. I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? Another version, don't you perceive it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That doesn't make any sense, does it? The beast of the field will honor me. That doesn't make much sense. The jackals and the ostriches, unclean birds. Because I will give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. See, the Lord says, hey, in the future, it's, it's a couple hundred years from now, but don't sit there and get all in love and worshiping the past and the things of God instead of God himself, because I'm going to do some stuff that makes no human sense to you, okay? I mean, isn't that what that, it's like, I love that when people went to ask Jesus for things, they didn't ask for things that made sense, they asked for things that made no sense whatsoever, Right? God's going, man, I can take an unclean bird like an ostrich and I can come and be one of my people, right? We got some serious ostriches and jackals in this room, right? (laughs) Unclean birds. But God says, I can take an unclean bird and I can make it something beautiful. It's it's like, it's it's really crazy. It's like a, a, a road in the wilderness or a river in the desert. It sounds like the opposite of reality, but my economy is very different than yours. And so I'm asking you to, to welcome that as a child would, to, to go, okay, Father, it makes no sense, but you do things that make no sense, and you get the glory for it. It's not like I'm helping you out because I get it, and I can help you design this, this event. No, I can't do anything. And it may, but you love to do things that just blow my mind because that's the kind of dad that you are. So Isaiah tells, hey, God's people, get ready for that. Well, that's, see, that's what he told them. Now, it looked like they were getting it. Remember the 49,000, but then we saw what would happen after the foundation. And then 16 years later, that's when he had to send Zechariah and Haggai because they just dropped the ball, and they weren't looking to see God do anything. They said, forget God's temple, forget God's work, forget God's miracle and his mercy is new every day. I need me a new patio. I need me a new roof. I need me a new, and they're all busy on the luxurious houses that they're building, Haggai talks about, right? They've totally lost focus of God and expectation of the wonders of God. And they're living still in the past. And so God speaks to them through the prophet Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, Say to Zerubbabel, the governor, right, son of Shetiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of God's people there in the land, does anyone remember this house, the temple, in its former splendor? So he's referring to... Solomon's temple. Remember the old people in Ezra 3, 16 years earlier when they were busy? What happened is that whole buzzkill that took place at that ceremony quenched the Holy Spirit. The people of God just lost focus of the kingdom and the hand of God moving, and they went on their own lives. That's what took place. So he says, you remember, remember that? Of course they did. That's all they lived for. That's, they just remembered that. That's their foundation. How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. In this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. He says, listen, guys, you're looking at this half, you know, erected temple. And, you're, and remember the last one, how great it was? That's that's the Flintstones. This is going to be the Jetsons. Okay. That's, that, that, that's the Stone Age, man. Wait till you see the glory of what I'm going to do. Stop looking in the past of what it was and realize I'm going to do something much greater. Now, see, that didn't make any sense to some of these old geezers. They're going, no, we've seen what the foundation's like and what it was, and we know what the old one's like, and it makes no sense. So God shows him and says, hey, I know what you're thinking about. Remember this? Yes, of course we do. It's all we think about, God. We weep, we mourn over it, that we wish we had it again. Yeah, I know. So listen, stop that. 
And listen, because I'm about to do something that's so much greater than you can possibly imagine. And I want you to begin to think like that and talk like that and pray like that and expect like that, you see. Right? This is what we as the church need to do. We need to get up and go, man, I don't care what I saw you do 10 years ago in the mission field. I want to see something amazing today. Something incredible that makes no human sense to where it's very clear this has to be God. Because I want the news to go out through the land, right? Isn't that what happened, right? When, when you saw this girl raised from the dead and this woman healed from the issue of blood, it says, and the news went out through the land. So something happened that made no sense that the Pharisees and the religious protocols of the day would have said, no, 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 right? It, the total opposite happened. And then it went out, and Jesus was lifted up in the midst. That's what we need to see. That's the way Jesus walked, right? That's the way he walked. John chapter 5, it says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel or wonder would be the word. Jesus says, the Father just shows me marvelous, wondrous things, and he gives me these things to do, and it's incredible. And it's all, he says, that you might wonder. You might go, wow. Wow, I don't want to just hear about it or read it. God, I want to experience it. And it's not because I'm looking to toot my own horn that I got the power of God. It's because I want to see the name of Jesus lifted up. Right? I think that's why Jesus said in John chapter 14, Assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And the greater works than these he will do. Yes, because I go to the Father. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. He's saying the Holy Spirit's with you now, but because I go to the Father, now he's going to be not only in you, but upon you. And that's what's going to enable you to do even greater things than what you're seeing me doing right now. This is some good promises, don't you think? Oh my gosh, this is great. And he says, and whatever you ask, I like that word whatever. In the Greek, it means whatever. Yeah. And, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. That the Father, no, not so you can go look how spiritual I am. I can prophesy and fathom ministries. And I speak in tongues more than all of you. And, and when I lay hands on people, get over yourself. It's not about you right? It's so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, right? And we have not because we ask not, but when we do ask, we're, not ask, we're asking in an old wineskin mindset, not a new wineskin. See, the good thing is you can take an old wineskin and soak it in water, and it helps it to expand where you can put some new wine into it, and therefore it becomes a new wineskin. That's why, man, we just soak ourselves in the Word of God, right? And I ain't so much talking about the scripture as much as Jesus and him. It, it, it changes our mindset. I mean, just read these psalms to you. May, may, this, may this soak right now. Maybe this just expand your wineskin right now. Psalms 107, they see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep. Psalms 1 and 3, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. Psalms 15, remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders. In Psalms 72, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. Only does wondrous things. See, he's looking to do things that make no sense. They bring this awe, right? And you guys have heard me see illustrations so many times, but it always just kind of goes to my head. The first time my parents took me in California, whether it was this place called Knott's Berry Farm, it was like a, maybe some of you Californians might know what that is, you know, it's like a Disney World, and I'm going, I'm looking at these rides, I don't know what hydraulics are, I don't even know what electricity is, I'm just going, so Dumbo really does fly. Oh my gosh. It's just, just this wonder of just like, wow, God, it makes no sense to me. It makes no sense that I can get on this roller coaster and it's going to just do this and do this, even go upside down and I'm not going to die. 
That's, that makes no sense, but it doesn't matter because I'm just a kid. And, and dad, is it safe? It's safe. But it doesn't make any sense. But if you say it's safe, then it's totally cool, even though I don't understand it. That's wonder, you see. And we're lacking that wonder when we talk to dad because we're sucking all the wineskin and we try to pigeon to God with our intellect and our experiences, you see. Then they brought little children to Jesus that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. Now, why would disciples rebuke people who bring in kids? Are they not worth the Lord's time? Is it just not part of his daytimer? Are they just not important enough? See, the disciples were looking at these kids, and, and they weren't realizing they, they really needed to stop being like they were being and be more like these kids, right? But we have a tendency to have the childlike mind and we look at that and go, that's just not worth their time. We're grown up. And we become confident in our own abilities, in our own intellect, in our own reasoning, in our own resources. And, and that's not the kind of faith that God's looking for to see the new thing that he's doing. But they're not looking at that. They're not thinking that way. When Jesus saw this, he was greatly displeased. So Jesus isn't happy here. Huh. He said, let the little children come to me. So here Jesus isn't happy, and he's talking while he's not happy. I said, I've always pictured, oh, let the little children come to me. You know, it, it, that's not how it looks. Man, he's not happy because they're not perceiving what's going on here. And they're pushing down the very element that God uses to connect our faith with his wondrous hand moving. They're not getting it. Let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Oh, that's so beautiful. Man, how do we experience the new thing? This is what's like God just impressing upon me like, Dave, I, I, I want you to be open to whatever I want to do. Whenever I want to do it, however I want to do it. I want you to expect the unexpectable. Now, how does that, it seems like it doesn't even make sense, right? I mean, like, for example, do you expect God just to, like, show up in your house one day and blow your mind with his presence? Or do you go, well, no, that's when we're at Reveal. You know, is that what you expect? If you're going to be like just the Spirit of God poured out upon you, well, well, I need to be anointed with oil. I need the elders to lay hands on me. Well, that's not the way it worked with me, I'll tell you that. Do you walk around just going, God, I'm just open. I mean, and whatever he's going to do, it'll never contradict what's in the written word. I want to be clear on that, okay? When I'm back a new thing. I'm not talking about new philosophy and new doctrine, okay? For some of you, so you don't tar- start your own cult tomorrow. Let me clarify that. Okay, it, it's gonna it's gonna line up with what's in Genesis to Revelation. Otherwise, you're listening to a different spirit. Okay, but there's so much in there that we're not experiencing. You see, and it's because we're not expecting the unexpectable. Like we're, we're gonna ask God, God, I just. I'm, I'm expecting you to give me your peace today in the midst of this craziness that's going on. And, and I know you're going to do it. I don't know how you're, what if he wants to do it through someone you just don't like and they want to speak a word to you? Well, God wouldn't speak through them. Really? That what you think? Well, what if God wanted to speak to you listening to a hymn? I, I, like, I like the new stuff. What if it's in him he wants to speak to you through and, and minister to you? Are you open to that? Or are you going, well, that's just not my style? What if it's Christian rap music? All right? I know some of you old farts in here. All right? You just go, man, I don't, I don't like, did he say fart in church? Sunday was snot. The day's a fart. I mean, yeah. Anyway, but it's like, really, we, we, we go, well, that's just not my style. It's not about your style. It's not about your comfort zone. 
It's about just going, God, I just want a new thing. I just want you to speak to me. I want you to touch me. I want you to empower me. I, I, I want to be able just to be wide open that I walk into a 7-Eleven and I see somebody with oxygen max on and they can't breathe and you want me just to go lay hands on them and just pray over them and do something amazing. And I just, if that's what you want to do, God, okay, right? It, it, but we just go, well, that's, I'm in the old wineskin, which is that was done in the Bible. That's, and that's done through people who are really spiritual. Now, what that's done through ostriches and jackals. That's who God moves through, right on? I mean, when you start looking at it like that, you go, well, Dave, that means we're all qualified to have a river in a desert. We're all qualified to have a, a highway in the wilderness in our lives. We're all qualified because it, God just good and his mercies are new every day and he's wanting to do something new all the time. So I need to get out of my old wines can is what I'm comfortable with, what I intellectually understand, and go, I just want to have a childlike faith before you. So I start off like this. God, forgive me for my ignorance and my arrogance. I'm sorry. I'm open to whatever you want to do. And where I'm not open, help me to be more open. Now, when you do pray that, brace yourself. Because <laughs> you never know what God's going to do to help you answering your prayer, right? But he will. He'll do something, and, and he'll mold you and shape you and do things. And, and in the midst of it, it might be a 911 that you just feel like you're going to die. But then five years later, you look back and go, God, thank you for destroying me, that you might rebuild me and do something amazing where I have a childlike faith. Because I can tell you, for me, if, if I go back to like between, like say, 95, 90, excuse, 97, in those years of my life, I look back and I go, what a Pharisee. What, you know? Well, Mr. Attempt to be a theologian and understand this Greek and Hebrew word, and I got my Greek 101 book, and I'm doing all this stuff, and, and I'm just like, what a fool. What a fool. You know, and, and it wasn't that anybody could tell me anything, so God just destroyed me completely and started making something different. Now I'm 50, and I feel like a child. I really do. I got to tell you, I feel like a child today because I'm like, every time I come and talk to you guys, I go, Lord, I don't know what to say to them. I don't know. I get up here and I'm going, God, please don't let me be an idiot. You just talk to them. You know, Pastor Ty was praying over me before I came out. And he's like, God, just for your name's sake, speak through Dave tonight. Bless your people. I was like, Amen. You know, like, God, you got to do this because I just can't. And, 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 and then when you pray it, you go, And you will. And you will, you, because, you know, good fathers know to have good gifts, gifts bad, evil fathers get good gifts on earth, so how much better gifts does a heavenly father give to his kids? So I'm asking this thing, and it's for your glory, it's for your people, it's for your kingdom, and so the word spreads around the land, so I know you're going to answer this prayer, right? So when I'm asking God, heal my marriage, I know what's your will, I don't care what the counselors say or the lawyers say. You're going to heal this because I know it's your will, God. So in Jesus' name, I pray that, right? Oh, God, my kids, they're disrespectful. They're flirting around with pot. You know, they're living a licentious lifestyle. And you see it all, but I know that's the enemy. And I know that's not your will. So I come against that demon in Jesus' name, and I take control over that in the name of the Lord. And I know you're going to do it, Lord. You're going to do it because that's the kind of father you are. So I'm not going to doubt, like, Man, I don't know, maybe I didn't read my Bible enough or pray enough to ask that. Maybe I'm not holy enough to be able to ask that a father. Old wineskin, old wineskin, right? Don't think like that. New wine, new wineskin, right? That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's by grace the Father loves us. It's by grace the Father gives us things. And we enter his throne room to find grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Worth and earning has nothing to do with it. You see, right? God, help us to be a people that get up every day and go, Father, what's new with your Holy Spirit today? Amen. Amen. Hey, let's pray. Jesus, I think like your disciples, we have resisted your Holy Spirit when he's called us to come to you like a child. 
So Lord, as your word tells us, we humble ourselves before you tonight. And we confess to you, Lord, that you're able to do anything. Nothing is too difficult for you, God. Where we've doubted you, Lord, we renounce that tonight in the name of Jesus. Where we've tried to put you in a box and limit you with our doubts, we call that down tonight in the name of Jesus. We hand over our heart and our mind, our thoughts, our motives to you, God, to touch and empower us to think as a child, to, to worship and wonder, God, to pray and wonder, knowing that your works, they're only wondrous. So God, we want to believe beyond what we can understand. We want to believe beyond what makes sense to us, and, and we want to believe beyond what's comfortable for us. So we recognize, God, we can't make this happen, so we surrender that work to you, God, to do tonight. So we welcome you, Holy Spirit, to search our hearts tonight, to search our minds. May you probe every motive, every thought. And where we're standing in pride, in our doctrinal hobby horses, in our bitter roots of judging people, God, we repent of that tonight. We ask that you would open our eyes to see your handiwork. Lord, whether it's just looking up at the, the beautiful artwork in the sky, and your creation, whether it's the person in front of us or in back of us tonight that you created, God, they're, they're a work of wonder. We just want to have eyes to see and ears to hear what you're doing. We so want to be in step with you, God. So may you give us the heart of expectation of glorious things. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, tonight to baptize us in your power. We confess to you, God, that we have no power in of ourselves. So may you stir within us a holy passion for Jesus. We welcome you, God, to bring this love affair between the bride and the bridegroom. Bring it into our lives tonight. We welcome you to do this, Father. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Hey, stand to your feet. Guys, I want to ask that when you hear messages like this and challenges like this to do something with it. And this is what I mean. Instead of going back in the world or even going home tonight, just turning the radio on, keep it off. Talk to the Father. Talk to Him. Listen to Him. Right? Say, God, now I've heard the call and the challenge. Now give me my marching orders. Speak to me. Tell me what you want me to pray. Because I know if you tell me to pray it and I ask it in your name, it's going to happen. So tell me to pray for something that makes no sense whatsoever. Because I want my faith to grow and I want it to be childlike. And I, I, so help me to grow in this. I don't want to just hear a teaching like this and go, oh, that's a good word or it's not a good word, whatever, and just walk away and then do nothing with it. Because then we're just like the majority of the church today. And that's sad. But if we'll take something like this and we'll go, that was the appetizer. The main course is getting in my prayer closet tonight or early tomorrow morning. I'm setting my clock an hour early and I'm getting up and I'm doing business with Father God. And I'm going to welcome him to do something in me. Man, can you imagine if just a third of the church would take the word that serious and welcome the Holy Spirit in their lives and their lives on that level? Oh my gosh, what would happen? Father, may you help us at Reveal Fellowship to take your word that serious and to take you at your word and receive your promises with faith. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you, family.